Selamat datang di Disrupto Fest 2020 Exploration Experimentation Road to Indonesia 2045. Disrupto Fest merupakan festival inovasi teknologi, sains, bisnis, dan gaya hidup tahunan yang kali ini untuk pertama kalinya diadakan secara virtual. Disrupto Fest 2020 merupakan kolaborasi antara Disrupto, Weird Group, Samara Life, KVB, serta didukung oleh Sampurna University sebagai presenting partner untuk channel Business and Lifestyle, Merck, Indica Energy, Petrosi, British Council, Plaza Indonesia, and Plus Jakarta. Saya Anina Fendi yang akan menjadi host dalam sesi Is Animal Free Meat the Future of Food? Bersama narasumber saya, Profesor Mark Bose. Nah, sebelum masuk ke diskusi, saya akan mengingatkan Sambil menikmati Disrupto Fest 2020 ini, kamu juga bisa berdonasi dalam hashtag Disrupto Berbagi melalui benihbaik.com dan berkontribusi untuk membantu tenaga pengajar yang terdampak pandemi seperti guru honorer, kemudian juga ada siswa-siswi yang kurang mampu untuk uh, belum bisa mendapatkan akses belajar menggunakan internet. Cara yang mudah sekali, langsung scan QR Code yang ada di layar sebelah kanan bawah selama acara berlangsung. Jadi gampang banget scan QR code-nya atau juga bisa melalui situs benibaik.com pilih programnya berbagi kebaikan untuk pendidikan bersama di Sabto Fest. Selain channel Tech and Science yang sedang kamu tonton sekarang ini bersama saya, di Disrupto Fest 2020 juga ada channel lain yaitu Business and Lifestyle dan akan diakhiri dengan program musik nanti malam. Sementara untuk program workshop bisa diikuti melalui aplikasi Chat. Untuk jadwal lengkapnya, cek Disrupto Fest 2020 uh, di Instagram at disrupto.id atau website-nya disrupto.co.id Dan buat kalian yang lagi mungkin sambil instastory, anything berhubungan dengan social media, jangan lupa hashtagnya Disrupto Fest 2020 dan hashtag Exploration Experimentation, jangan lupa tag at disrupto.id Let's begin the session without further ado Please welcome Professor Mark Post Chief Scientific Officer of Moza Meat and the inventor of cultured meat Good afternoon from Jakarta, Professor Good afternoon, Anidi Okay, first of all, should I address you with Professor or would you prefer Mark instead? I prefer Mark Nobody ever calls me Professor, yes I have a okay, professor then. at medical school, but nobody ever calls me that. Okay then, okay then, Mark. So I would like to know more. We would like to know more about cultured meat. What is it? Well, cultured meat is actually meat as you know it. It's exactly the same tissue, but made in a different way. It's made from the same cells that meat is made from, but not inside of a cow or any other animal but outside of the animal, basically in a lab or in a factory. Um, it's a medical technology originally to make tissues and organs uh, that are dysfunctional or are absent, uh, but we are now applying that medical technology to uh, to making meat because we feel that's necessary. So you, during the process, you don't kill, you don't slaughter the animal. No, we don't have to. You you take a small biopsy. I I can show you if you like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A little uh, little little uh, presentation. Uh, so we we basically take uh, a biopsy from an animal with a needle. Um, you get a small piece of tissue out of it, a small piece of muscle, one centimeter long, one millimeter in diameter. Um, so very, very small, but that muscle has stem cells. So if you zoom in and look under the microscope, you see a cell like this. It's a typical muscle cell. Um, it consists actually of multiple cells, and some of those are actually stem cells. And they are sitting there waiting to repair that tissue if it's injured. And when the tissue is injured, they start to proliferate, uh, start to divide, multiply, Um, and then at some point, um, so so we can also do that in the lab, we let them multiply. And then at some point you have to make muscle out of it. Um, so first 
they have to make a a fiber, a small fiber, which is still very primitive um, and doesn't have a lot of protein and doesn't really feel like muscle, but it's already kind of the precursor of uh, muscle tissue. Um, and then we let the muscle do what they are supposed to do is uh, perform labor uh, because mm. then kind of bulky. Um, and for that, we, we place them actually in a, um, in a certain ring structure where the cells can find each other, attach to each other, form a tissue, and surprisingly, they start to contract, uh, just like muscle does. And with, because they are in this ring structure, that contraction leads to tension. And tension is the biggest trigger for basically making thicker muscles. Think about when you run a marathon, you don't really get thick muscles. So movement in itself doesn't create thick muscles, but tension does. And um, if you go to the gym and you pump iron, you get thicker muscles. So right. that's essentially uh, what, what the technology is. So this, the whole process from when you did the biopsy until whatever this is, the ring. So it only take three weeks, Professor, and Mark, sorry, to, 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 to do it? Um, no, no, the whole, pro well, first you have to uh, multiply those cells. Okay. And every cell divides in about 24 hours. So every day uh, you get twice the number of cells that you had before. So if you do that, so in the day first you have one, then you have two, four, eight, 16, and that actually accumulates very, very quickly. So in about three weeks, you have more than enough cells to make um, uh, thousands of hamburgers. And then it takes another three weeks to let them mature into muscle tissue so that you actually have meat. Obviously, we do the same with fat tissue because you know, otherwise it would be very lean and dry. Um, and we uh, use kind of a similar system to make fat tissue, although the last phase, of course, is slightly different. So the end result is not going to be only ground beef. It can also be something else as well? Yeah, it can. Um, so currently, um, the technology is focused on making ground beef um, with the fat and with the, the muscle itself. Um, eventually, we want to create, let's say, a ribeye steak or a T-bone steak or something like that. Um, that requires additional technologies also from the medical field. Um, so that's not our first thing. It's, it's a little bit more complex to do that, but it's doable. Um, so first of all, we are focusing on ground beef, which yeah. is, by the way, 50% of the meat market. Um, and then later on, when we have cracked that, we will start uh, making ribeye steaks. Right, that's right. Of course, because everyone loves hamburger, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a big, it's a big market. Yeah. Right. So, what is the uh, behind the scenes story? What made you do this innovation? I guess. Well, first of all, um, we were using this technology already um, for medical purposes. I was actually making blood vessels for people who require bypass surgery for coronary uh, disease. Uh, for heart disease. Um, and so the technology was already there and I was already working on it. Um, and at some point we had a, uh, a person in the Netherlands called Willem van Eelen who was passionate about this idea. He couldn't do it himself. He wasn't a scientist. And he was already 86 before I met him. Um, and he said, uh, you should use this technology to make meat. And uh, when, so that kind of sparked the idea, which actually was already quite old, Winston Churchill in 1932 already refers to this idea um, in, in a book, but um, <clears throat> nobody ever did that. And so we were the first in 2013 to actually execute uh, that idea and having already you know, been very familiar with the technology, it was relatively easy for us although in the beginning, very costly um, to make the first hamburger. Oh, wow. So, okay, the, uh, I posted the story about me going to interview you on my Instagram, and then I got a lot of questions whether this meat is vegan or not, because you don't slaughter the animal, if it, you know, is this aligned with our vegan values? So 
What's your answer? Right. Well, technically, it's not vegan. It's it's an animal product. It's essentially the same as meat. Um, however, you don't have to slaughter animals. It's much less harmful to the environment. So for it, it depends really, uh, you know, what the reason for um, people being vegan is. Um, some people just don't like meat. Some people don't like to kill animals. Uh, some people um, uh, want to protect the environment. Um, so. It is, um, I think it is quite uh, up there with the values of most vegans um, that uh, we don't have to kill animals. We, we are protecting the environment. So I'm sure some vegans will start to eat meat again once this becomes available. And in fact, I know because when we talk to vegans and we do that a lot, um, about 20, 25% of vegans said, well, if this come, becomes available, I will start eating meat again. You're obviously not a vegan, right? Mark? I'm not a vegan, no, no. <laughs> okay. no I, I love cheese too much, and vegan cheese is really still not. It's not. <laughs> not it's not. <laughs> so, okay, so you, you touch upon uh, the environmental issues. Um, in your point of view, what is like the current issues of livestock farming, the uh, industrial farming. What is what is it so bad about it? I guess. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, there are two things um, that are related to each other. Um, one is that meat consumption and meat production globally is going to increase, according to the FAO. It's going to increase by seventy percent. Uh, that's not only because we go from um, 7 billion to 10 billion people, but also because people in um, China, um, uh, India, uh, Africa, um, and perhaps even Indonesia become richer and richer uh, and wealthier and wealthier, and then they start to eat meat. Um, so a lot of the people who currently cannot afford to eat meat will be able to afford that in the future. So that's why FAO predicts that this is going to increase by 70%. Wow. We, are, we are already using uh, more than half of all our agricultural lands to feed animals. Um, and so if you do that math, um, we will simply not be able to uh, produce enough meat for the entire population. It's still mm. it's simply not possible. Um, the other uh, really concern um, is that livestock farming contributes um, somewhere around 15% of all greenhouse gas emission uh, globally. Um, so if you are serious about protecting the environment, and I really are, I really am, um, then you should tackle livestock farming. And it's yes. especially cows because they emit methane um, and they are very, very inefficient in um, making food. Basically, you have to feed the animal eight times the amount of proteins that we get out of it as meat. Right. Yeah, we talk about hamburgers. Like, I, I'm sure you have this information, like one uh, pound or like a quarter pound of ground beef. Uh, like, what is the environmental effect on that alone? Yeah, so we, for a quarter pound of beef, so 125 grams, we need about eight, gra eight pounds of grain to feed the animal, um, about 250 liters of fresh water, um, again, to feed the animal, and let it graze and let it drink, um, and about uh, 10 square meters of land. Wow. and enough energy to power your microwave for 10 minutes. So it's a really resource intense uh, product that we are eating. Mm -hmm. And compared to cultured meat, what is the comparison of, uh, in terms of life cycle analysis? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. Of course, we don't quite know for sure yet because the entire production system is not really there yet. Um, but we, we know that that um, efficiency of changing feed into meat for us is going to be much, much higher. It's going to be at least a factor of three higher than for cows. Mm -hmm. um, but that will translate into 
um, a big reduction in the amount of land that we need, a big reduction in the amount of water. Um, energy, uh, the, the life cycle analyses up till now, which are really kind of premature, if you like, um, are not sure about the energy. Um, and for, again, for that, you need to define the entire process. Personally, I think that we will save energy, but you know, that's the, the verdict is still out there. So I guess we can say that self-altered meat is the solution for environmental issues related from the uh, industrial farming. If you want to keep on eating meat, yes, <laughs> it's the solution. The other solution is, of course, is that we all become vegetarian. Um, and that's that there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, we can easily live off a vegetarian diet. There are still 2 billion people on this planet who are vegetarian. So I'm not advocating that we all should eat meat. Uh, the fact is that we want to. And to me, it seems more difficult to change that basic human behavior um, than to just um, start working on a te uh, technology where people can still continue to do what they want to do. Uh, without the negative consequences on environment and food security and animal welfare. Right. Okay, so we receive questions. Jadi bagi Anda yang ingin bertanya, silakan langsung bertanya. Saya kita akan filter, nanti akan saya bacakan langsung ke Professor Marcos. But before we go into question, I'm curious, what does it taste like? Well, it's meat, so it tastes like meat. Um, we, we presented the hamburger in 2013. Um, And uh, I, I may want to show that video because it's yeah, kind of uh, um, yeah, it's kind of uh, illustrative. Uh, let me see if I. So we presented this in uh, 2013 in London in a uh, press conference. Here is the hamburger, um, and it was cooked and tasted by two food critics one from Austria and one from Chicago. And they uh, said, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is a hamburger. It was still a little bit dry because there was no fat in it. So it was a very lean hamburger. But oh, wow. they, they said, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is a hamburger. <clears throat> this, was, this was back in 2013. Um, it was not a product yet. We, uh, you know, it cost us a quarter million euro to make this hamburger. So it was really, really expensive. Uh, but it was to show to the world, uh, guys, we can do this. Um, and we actually uh, need to do this because we have a lot of issues coming up with um, livestock uh, meat production. Right, but it does look delicious. But when you mention the price of it, I'm not hungry anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, of course. So um, this was back in 2013. Um, we we know that we can uh, currently the price would be much much lower, still mm -hmm. higher than regular meat, but much much lower. Um, and eventually, because this is a more efficient system, it will reach the price of meat or actual be lower than that. Um, when that's going to happen, I'm not sure. Um, that may take another couple of years, but um, that that is going to happen, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so this is related to one of the questions from the audience. But we went the as you uh, have you already start selling this altered meat? No, no, we have not. Um, and there are uh, two reasons for that. And, and nobody has at the moment. Um, so we are no longer the only ones doing this. There are 40 to 50 companies worldwide working on this, either beef, chicken, pork, fish. Um, but nobody is selling yet. Um, and that's, uh, the, that's there are two reasons. One is that we still have to scale up production. So we have to set up a production system to, uh, to do that. Um, But more importantly, uh, this has to be regulated by regulatory officials in the various countries. So um, people want to, uh, the, the governments want to know that this is absolutely safe uh, before it can be sold to people. And of course, we are 100% sure that it is safe, but we need to provide that evidence to uh, the governments. In Europe, this is going to take Uh, at least a year and a half. Wow. Um, and um, so uh, the first one and a half, two years, 
you will not see a product on the market just because it's not regulated yet. I see. Okay, uh, interesting question from Yeni Kusuma. Uh, can you do it with chicken or seafood? Yeah. Yes, and actually quite a few companies are uh, doing this with chicken. Um, and uh, it's basically the same technology. Um, uh, chicken might be a little bit easier. On the other hand, you know, chickens are already very efficient animals. Um, so if you want to do this for animal welfare, then chicken is a great um, uh, way to go. If you're doing this for the environment, uh, chicken is not that really important because they right. don't It's have not really a threat for the environment, right? Exactly, exactly. It's mostly cows that are the big threat for the environment. Mm -hmm. So from happy forever, is there any differences between cultured meat with the natural one for human metabolism and nutrient content? Um, no, there's not. Eventually there's not. Um, we still have to kind of reach that full um, nutritional profile, if you like. Um, but uh, uh, once we have reached that, there's no difference whatsoever. It's, it's going to be exactly the same. The only thing that we could do, um, and, and we're looking into it, but it's not a primary goal at the moment, is that you could make the, uh, the cultured meat healthier than the original one. For instance, by um, making sure that those fat cells make more uh, omega-3 fatty acids um, instead of saturated fatty acids so that it's actually a, a healthier product for you. Th that possibility is there. Uh, we're not really focusing on it too much, but um, eventually we may want to do that. Okay. What about the energy intake from cultured meat? This is a question from Iksana Pianza. Will it be sufficient enough for human energy intake? And will this meat just a substitute food or have a good prospect to be commercialized? I guess, is it a gimmick in a way? Oh, oh, well, I hope not, because uh, that's why we're not, that's not why we're doing this. We really want to uh, transform the industry so that the impact on the environment is much reduced. So not a, uh, not a gimmick, not a niche, but a commodity, um, as meat typically is. So we are really, um, you know, gearing towards uh, scaling up, making the price competitive so that everybody can buy it. Um, so that it eventually replaces to substantially uh, livestock meat because we, uh, in my mind, we have to get rid of that. Right. So, but is it viable though to commercialize this? <laughs> Um, well, um, uh, we think so, and our investors seem to think so. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it's um, it, 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 there's a lot required um, to get from a quarter million euro hamburger to a fifty cent hamburger, right? Mm. Um, and and we know we can get there, but there's really a lot of things have to come together to to get to those fifty cents. Um, to give you one example, um, so I, I mentioned this is a medical technology. Um, all our supplies are medical supplies. They are very expensive um, and they don't need to be. Um, if I buy sugar, I buy sugar for, uh, for from a medical grade, but I can also just use sugar from the local supermarket, which is much cheaper. Um, and so gradually we are looking at those changes to make all the ingredients a lot cheaper and thereby the product a lot cheaper. It's doable, but it will take some time. Okay. This is another question. Well, I mean, we, you have a lot of questions. A lot of people are yeah, curious I'm, about I'm, this. I'm used, to, I'm used to that, yes. <laughs> okay. Can we, from Ardi here, can we fortify the meat with nutrients that we need? For example, does the meat will have more vitamin C from the real meat? You're a doctor, so, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you uh, you can, of course, you can uh, by by feeding the cells or um, yeah by feeding the cells uh, vitamins. So one of the vitamins that we have to feed the cells is vitamin B12. Uh, vitamin B12 is necessary for us. Um, 
Meat is a very good source of vitamin B12 um, and other animal proteins are generally a very good source of vitamin B12. Um, so we have to feed the animals or they have to feed the cells vitamin B12 to have it in the meat because the cells don't, themselves don't make vitamin B12. Uh, right. Cows, cows don't make vitamin B12. Um, they have to have it in their feed as well to uh, get it in their muscle. So we are doing exactly the same. Um, and you can, you can increase it. You can um, add other vitamins or minerals that are, are good for people as long as, you know, the cells can, um, we know they can, you know, easily grow in higher vitamin C concentrations, for instance, um, or vitamin B12. So you can fortify, yes. Right. Okay. So, okay. I'm obviously, I don't have a medical background, so I'm just going to ask you this. Like, how do you feed a cell? Right. Um, well, so a cell doesn't have teeth. Uh, it doesn't have a digestive system. So you uh, basically feed them all the kind of very basic ingredients like sugar, glucose, um, uh, amino acids. Um, we have 20 two amino acids, eight of them have to be in the feed. What is um, chemical though? All chemicals? Well, in the end, everything is chemical, right? We are, as human beings, are a bag of, I, I try to uh, tell my medical students that a bag of, uh, of chemicals. Amino, so every protein that you eat is made from amino acids. Um, it's a chain of amino acids, and we assemble those amino acids into proteins, or the cow does, into muscle proteins, and then we eat the proteins. Um, we can also eat the amino acids. Um, that's entirely possible, um, and you can, you know, you can design a drink. Um, and in fact, some people have done that, that contain all these amino acids and glucose, and you can live of those um, ingredients. Um, it's, not, it's not a very nice life because you don't eat food, but right. <laughs> you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so in the end, it's these building blocks um, of life, glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, um, that you have to feed the cells. Mm. And the, the amino acids are um, plant derived. So they come, they, we basically harvest them from plants. Okay. And um, do we get the same effect as we eat the real ground beef? As opposed to the exactly ground the meat? Exactly the same yeah. ingredients, vitamins, whatever vitamins that we need? Yeah. 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 It's exactly the same. Okay. All right. Okay. Another burgeoning question. Um, a lot of question, uh, questions about, uh, is it from the religious point of view, is it halal? Um, depends how you uh, do it. Um, so um, I had a lot of discussions with, um, with uh, Islamic and also with um, uh, Jewish people, whether this would be halal or kosher. Um, for halal, um, you have to slaughter the animal. Um, there's no way around it. It specifically says in the Quran that you cannot um, eat a part of the animal while the animal is still alive. Um, and you also cannot use, um, that's another kind of stipulation, use blood um, to create a product. Um, so right. very specific restrictions. Now, can you do that? Yes, of course you can. You can slaughter one animal, take take all its stem cells, and feed half of Indonesia with one animal. Right. You right? would still reduce the number of cows tremendously. You would still have the environmental impact. You would still have the food security impact. But yes, you will have to sacrifice one cow for that. Mm -hmm. um, and. And then we are not using blood to culture cells. We used to do in the past, but we are no longer doing that. So we are gradually given that provision that you need to slaughter the cow um, and then use all of it to feed many, many people. Um, it can be halal. Mm. What about kosher? From the kosher, from the kosher in, point of view? Same thing, same thing. Actually, the texts in the Torah and the Quran are remarkably similar. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, we uh, a different discussion, Mark, but okay. 
<laughs> right, but uh, at least at, two, at this, from from this point of view, they are remarkably similar, um, and it's the same thing. You have to slaughter the animal in a kosher way. Uh, interestingly, um, uh, rabbis um, seem to th- want to go to in a discussion whether this is. Uh, whether this is actually meat as we know it. Um, Because as as you probably know, in the kosher kitchen, it's kind of problematic because you have to separate all the milk-related products from the uh, meat-related products. So you basically have to have two things of everything um, to separate that. Um, And so they want to argue that it's uh, what they call parve. It's neither milk nor meat. Um, and then you don't have that problem anymore in the kitchen. Um, but that would be somewhat of a stretch, I think. Um, uh, but it's the same thing in terms of slaughtering. You would have to slaughter the animal in a kosher way um, and then get all the stem cells and make meat from it. Right. But I guess if you have that vegan values that for animal welfare... You, you would have want to use the blood or blood. yeah yeah but you know it's it's um I, I don't want to go into too much details because these these discussions are always emotional they are not completely irrational right um so you could argue that slaughtering one animal is better than um you know taking biopsies from 20 animals yeah and to be honest, I would argue that. <laughs> um, I would, um, f- for me personally, as a very rational um, um, person, um, not emotional about this, um, I would rather um, slaughter one animal, take all its stem cells, produce a lot of meat of it, than to um, take biopsies from 20 animals. Right, right. So, okay. The general general public typically (laughs) very much likes the idea of keeping the animals alive. Yes, yes. I'm one of that believers, actually. Right, right. No, I I can see that and I respect that. But, you know, if you both, it's, it's a discussion and both points of view, I think, are legitimate. Right. Okay. So I, I noticed that um, innovation in, in in Europe has always been receptive. Like people, you know, would appreciate, you know, uh, with this kind of innovation. Uh, have you tried it though in the market outside the Netherlands? Um, well, there, there are a lot of surveys uh, being done. So people, so, so initially the response is always uh, yuck. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we need this. I don't think I want this. I don't want to eat it. Um, it seems like scary. Um, and I get that. Um, um, on the other hand, uh, th- this this has a lot to do with safety. So we are, as a as a human species, we are biologically programmed not to eat things that we don't know because they might be poisonous, right? So um, on the other hand, once we get familiar with products, we are very flexible and we eat, um, you know, people eat hamburgers um, and they don't know what's in it. They don't know how it's made and they still eat it because you have developed trust in that product. Um, So this requires some um, uh, marketing and some uh, getting getting your head around the idea. So yeah. a, a lot of surveys have been done since 2011 in various regions of the world, um, mostly Europe and the US, but also India and China and Australia and uh, South Korea, where uh, the question was asked, you know, what do you think about this? Uh, do you think this is potentially acceptable or not? Yeah. And over the time since 2011 up till now, you see that gradually that acceptance, that idea of that this could this, this could be accepted um, increases. Um, and not only in regions like Europe or the US, but also in India, China and, and Australia and South Korea. So I'm, I'm reasonably positive that, um, well, actually I know I'm, I'm much more positive than that. I, I have no doubt that at some point people will accept this, but it will require um, careful introduction. Right, right. So uh, we have uh, another question from Iksan Ardianza, whom he thinks that the meat is going to be pricey. We talked about price before. So yeah, there is that concern that, wow, it sounds expensive. 
Yeah, yeah, and um, I I completely understand. I have, uh, you know, I, I, that's we want this to be a commodity, and to, for this to be a commodity, it has to be cheap. Uh, it cannot be it can be maybe slightly more expensive than regular meat, but not much more. Um, and we think we can actually make it cheaper, uh, and that has to be that has to be done. Um, our modeling and our calculations show that it can be done, but we still have to get there. Um, and for me, it is as important as um, as for you, uh, because I want this to become a commodity and not like something nice for uh, the rich and wealthy in Silicon Valley. Mm. So, okay, this is a good question from Yuzuo Harvey how to scale up the culture clean industry so it can be affordable right um so as i mentioned um well i didn't mention that but um up till three years ago we were the only ones in the world doing this um and since three years um 50 startup companies popped up um it's still it's still relatively small but they are they're increasing in numbers very rapidly mm -hmm. um and um, uh, each of them has to go through a scale up of production. Um, the, the production typically happens in um, brewery type of uh, kettles of, um, of big aluminum or copper or tanks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, think about a brewery. That's probably kind of the, the, the easiest way to think about it. And um, a lot of products are already being made with this technology. This technology is out there. Um, we just have to apply it to our specific cells and our specific tissue. So it is scalable. Um, the way we look at it, we would like to spread the technology to different producers as fast as we can so that it can actually uh, be scaled out instead of scaled up. So you can uh, have a lot of uh, licensed producers in the world who produce it themselves uh, so that it doesn't really have to come from, let's say, our factory in, in five years. Right, so okay, Let, uh, Mark, I want you to give us an illustration. Say I would truly support uh, cultured meat, and uh, I want it to be like the hamburger meat, okay? And then as we know, like in the U.S. alone, uh, nine out of ten people eats hamburger, and they're what three hundred forty million population, I guess. Mm -hmm. And let's say if you introduce this cultured meat, and and subs becomes the substitute of the ground beef that they use for hamburger. Like, uh, how big can we save the environment? Like, what's the impact, environmental impact? Um, well, uh, it would be enormous. Um, so you would reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emission, um, at least in the U.S., uh, by um, roughly 10% or so. Um, that's a major reduction in greenhouse gas emission. Um, you would reduce the amount of water by uh, ninety percent uh, required for um, for meat production. Um, so those are and and you would and reduce the amount of land. Um, so that may actually be one of the bigger kind of consequences that you don't need all that land anymore. So yeah. you can. You can reforest land, um, you can repurpose land for um, ecological purposes. Um, so it, it, it gives a lot of flexibility um, in how you start to reverse climate change. Right. If You know what, Mark? If only Donald Trump is listening to our conversation right now, since he's eating junk food every day, right. like literally hamburger on a daily basis, imagine... That one person alone can save the environment of the U.S. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that would be that would be hilarious if uh, Trump uh, gets heralded as a, a, a ecology uh, ecological friend. Yes. Exactly. For someone who doesn't believe climate change, that's a start, right? Right. Right. <laughs> okay. So, Mark, we know we mentioned the price. It would be one of the challenges. But what are the challenges to develop this? I guess. 
Uh, yeah, so there are, uh, we, we actually have covered, um, I think, the challenges. One is uh, scaling up. Um, I mentioned how we envision doing that um, and that the technology is basically there, but we still have to apply it. Um, the price is a challenge um, and the regulatory approval, um, I'm sure it will happen, uh, but it will take time. Um, I'm also, um, you know, I, I really, as a consumer, I want our food to be safe. So I also, um, you know, I think that's a good thing that we have to go through that regulatory approval, but it does take time. Um, and it may be, you know, as we, as we probably know, uh, these regulatory uh, pathways and, and yeah. government, uh, government kind of uh, regulations are also subject to lobbies, right? So there might be a meat lobby that doesn't want this to happen. So that could be a threat. Um, we, we, there are some indications that there will be pushback from uh, the meat industry. So we have to be uh, aware of that and have to be able to do something about that. Has uh, it already been a pushback? Right now in the Netherlands? Uh, yeah, yeah, somewhat. You see in a couple of um, American states that um, there is legislation ongoing that we will not be allowed to call this meat. Um, but have to find a different name name for it. I'm not really that interested in it, but um, you know, a lot of people in the U.S. are kind of worried about this. Um, so there has been pushback, and you have to expect that there will be pushback because it will have consequences for the existing industry. Um, so you know, people start to defend that. Um, and the last challenge which I already mentioned, I don't think is going to be a huge challenge, but it, it is somewhat of a challenge is to get people to accept this um, and to eat it kind of in a in right. massive. Yeah. Um, and again, I think, you know, that, uh, none of these challenges are unsurmountable, but there are challenges. Yeah. Well, if people can eat impossible meat or beyond meat, then I guess people can eat this too, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Um, and actually, you know, that would be, um, I get that question a lot. Of why not just go for vegetarian or vegan substitutes of meat? Uh, yeah. because they are increasingly available. They get better and better. Um, but I think they will, and a lot of people with me think that they will not go all the way. It will not be um, a full kind of replacement of the meat that we know because we just, because they are not quite the same. Um, and for hamburgers, that may be fine, but for a ribeye steak will not be fine. So in a way, our endeavors to make hamburgers are kind of an exercise towards the, the next ambition to, to make a, a ribeye steak. But um, for me, it would be, um, you leave it to the consumers, right? The consumers eventually decide, do I want to eat an impossible burger or do I want to eat a, a cultured hamburger? And that's fine. That's the that's the fair kind of comparison that you're going to make in the future. My belief is that people will want to eat real meat. Um, that, yeah. that keeps on going. Because uh, vegans even still miss the taste of meat. You know, and that's why Impossible and Beyond Meat Burger exists. Uh, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some some vegans do. Not everybody, but some do. They they keep craving for meat. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah. Oh, uh, another interesting question here from Yusuo Hadi. There's a company that also makes lab-grown dairy product. Is how does that possible? Uh, yeah, it's a different technology. Um, so, for dairy, basically, it's a beverage. So, you uh, at least if you start with milk, um, it's a beverage. So, it's mostly water. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what you do, uh, it's a company called Perfect Day. They are uh, most advanced. They are from Silicon Valley. I know them very well. They just raised uh, $300 million uh, to um, scale up their production. Um, uh, they are using a different technology. They are basically using um, uh, microorganisms, yeast or, or bacteria to make the proteins, to make the milk proteins that, that make milk milk. 
and then they add water to it to uh, to make the beverage. Um, it's a different, it, yeah, it's a different technology because it requires um, bacteria or yeast. Um, and then they make the proteins like um, like uh, casein and lactoglobulin. Those are the, the the key proteins in milk. And then uh, they add uh, lactose and um, and water to it and produce a milk um, kind of tasting uh, beverage. They can make cheese right. of it and yogurt, and it's actually pretty good. It's a it's a very nice technology, uh, but it's slightly different from what we are doing. Okay, so, so for someone who is lactose intolerant, would it be safe? Very gampang man. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they can make uh, lactose-free um, uh, products as well, uh, mm -hmm. because basically now they have to add lactose to it. Um, yeah. So, um, and as you probably know, there are uh, dairy products out there, um, also from dairy companies, that are uh, lactose-free. Um, so that they have been, they're still somewhat expensive, but they have been created. It's perfectly doable. Right. So what is next for for Mosa Meat? Well, for us, it's um, um, uh, all those challenges. So uh, we, yeah. we are scaling up production. Um, we are filing for regulatory approval. Um, we are reducing the cost while we are doing this um, and eventually get to market um, in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. so and I, we, you, you, you will test it first in Europe or? Um, probably. Um, it depends a little bit on the regulatory approval. The regulatory pathway for Europe is very well uh, described. So we know exactly what we need to do and 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 how we need to do it. Um, however, it takes a long time. It takes a year and a half. Um, there might be other there there might be other regions where it goes faster. Um, uh, F, the, the U.S. is currently uncertain because they haven't quite delineated the path yet. So there's still some doubt whether this is going to be faster or not. Um, but you know, Singapore is um, uh, wants to start procedures pretty quickly. Um, so there might be, you know, um, our, our preference would be Europe because we understand the market the best, and and um, this has been kind of a European thing. Um, but um, uh, regulatory hurdles may force us to go to other markets first. Um, Interesting. Don't Interesting. Yeah. Okay, before I sum this conversation, is there anything else that we haven't got a chance to talk about, touch upon, that you want to share with us? Uh, no, I think we have covered the most important aspects of it. Um, and um, no, no, I, I can't think of anything that we uh, there are, I, I can talk about this as you have probably uh, realized for days. Um, yes. But th those were all would all be very detailed. And um, uh, the, the one thing that I want to mention is maybe uh, we did, we recently did a, a study here in the in the local uh, area. Um, where we actually had people, where we not only did a survey, but we had people eat a piece of meat that was labeled uh, cultured. Okay. And, um, uh, 200 people, and everybody ate it. Um, now, this was in the setting of a test, and people had to come to the university. And um, but, but if you create an environment where, where people trust um, uh, what they eat, they easily eat something that is labeled a uh, culture of meat. So it's kind of an idea, uh, kind of a psychology around it that is, um, so this was the first study was recently published um, where people actually ate um, uh, pieces that they thought were culture of meat. And um, uh, that again was actually quite positive. Right, so this culture of meat, we can say that is the future of food Right. And then it aligned with the value of animal welfare and then also saving the environment. 
of course, right? We illustrate, like, let's say, what happens in the U.S. if we can flip hamburger, ground beef hamburger to this. It can save a lot, basically. And then, yeah. as you know, yeah. So imagine a, a country like Indonesia, who also loves hamburger. Probably we can... Yeah, we do. We do love hamburger. We love junk food, though, which is another another health issue. But or maybe another not, another. Not satay. Huh? What's that? Not satay. Satay will be yes as well, but that's like a staple food, right? Junk food is like your gluttony cheat day type of food. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it, even even for that, if we can change that to cultured meat, that will be good, right? It's not so simple anymore. Yeah. Again, right? Yeah. And then, and yeah, innovation, if you, you got to start somewhere. It has to be like supported by the government, by policies, and of course the market. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, just the, find it. Go ahead, go ahead. The, the, the other aspect of this, I guess, is you can pretty much do this everywhere. Right, you don't need a lot of land. Um, you don't need a lot of water supply, um, so you can do this pretty much um, everywhere. That's why uh, states like Singapore are so interested in it because they want to be able to feed themselves. Um, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's a food food security issue as well. The Singapore they don't have the land. Yeah. So yeah. So that's the plus point: food security. So I guess that this is the food of the future. And I guess, you know what, Mark? Would you agree if I say the future is now that we should change our food habit? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we increasingly are aware of what the impact of our food system is on um, on our natural resources. And, uh, you know, we're going to 10 billion people. Um, we have to be very aware of uh, this impact. And it's not only coming from cultured meat. I mean, uh, if you think about how food, the whole supply chain works, we are globally wasting 40% of all the food that we produce. Um, and so if you find ways and also technological innovations uh, to reduce food waste, that would be another great uh, way to, um, to secure food and to reduce the impact of food on the environment. Right. And, you know, I have to share with you another uh, secret uh, my name, the the meaning of my name is actually sacred cow in Hindi. So I should be like, not eating cow. Maybe I can eat cultured meat. But yeah, you can, eat buffalo, you can eat buffalo though. Right? Exactly. Or that. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Professor Mark Rose, for joining us today and sharing about cultured meat and why is this important for the future of, of our food. Thank you, and stay You're safe. very welcome, man, and, and thanks for having me. No, it's all uh, our pleasure. Terima kasih kepada video dan cakap sebagai streaming partner, Bening Baik sebagai charity partner, serta pendukung acara lain, Sampurna University sebagai presenting partner untuk channel Business and Lifestyle, Mark, Indica Energy, Petrosi, British Council, Plaza Indonesia, dan Plus Jakarta. Terima kasih telah menyaksikan sesi is animal free meat the future of food? Jawabannya, yes, it is the future and the future is now, guys. Jangan lupa untuk cek channel lain karena masih banyak kemeriahan di Disrupto Fest 2020 selama dua hari ini. Saya Anini Effendi undur diri. Sampai jumpa. Bye, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great day. Yeah, same for you. Bye.